Welcome to The Point of View. This is your favorite current affairs show on television. On The Point of View, we usually get guests and interview them. But tonight is a special night. We are doing a playback of a very important economic program. On Friday, the KB and Ms. Arthur family, Ghana's former vice president, organized a forum to discuss economic policy making. I was privileged to be the moderator of an important segment of that event. Tonight, I'll be taking you through highlights of that program which had some very high-level guests. I'll tell you more when we come back. Stay with us. So welcome back. The family of former Vice President Kwesi Bekwe and Ms. Arthur organized a forum with the Department of Economics of the University of Ghana to discuss economic policy making. Their guest of honor was the uh, founder and president of the Africa Center for Economic Policy, Dr. K.Y. Amwako. He was speaking about economic policy making in Ghana. Now, the initial plan was for me to just interview him for an hour. We decided to break it into two. So he gave a 20 minute talk on the subject in front of a big, big audience, including former President John Dramani Mahama, his running mate for the 2020 elections, Professor Jenan Opokwajiman, the Vice Chancellor of the University of Ghana, Professor Nanaba Apia Amfu. Indeed, there were three former Vice Chancellors there, Professor Akila Pasoya, Professor Ivana Diamensa, and Professor uh, Ernest Aite. Packed hall, City Conference Center. So initially, I will show you the in thoughts of Dr. Amwaku on economic policy making in Ghana, where he speaks about the importance of leadership and institutions and consensus building in crafting economic policies that work. So let's hear that first. Your Excellency, former President of the Republic, John Mahama, Vice Chancellor of the University of Ghana, Professor Nana Abba Apia Amfo, my good old friends, Vice Chancellors, Ivo, Ivan and uh, Akilapa, thanks for all you've done for me in the past. It's good to see you again. Ministers, former ministers, my very good friends, Mrs. Matilda and Ms. Arthur and family, distinguished guests, friends and colleagues, or other protocols observed. It is my honor to be here today to speak in remembrance of Kwesi Bekwin and Mr. Arthur, or as we fondly know him, Pa Kwesi. He and I had a chance to work together on several occasions, and we shared a firm belief in Ghana's ability to transform and to live up to its potentials as Africa's greatest democracy. He was, for as long as I knew him, committed to making policy decisions based on strong evidence, but always keeping in mind the need to put citizens first, understand, and to understand how big picture policy impacts people living at all four corners of our beloved country. It's always an honor and a privilege for me to be here. I got my start in the Department of Economics. So I have my education at Legon to thank for a wonderful career. I also have Legon to thank for something even better. I was a student here when I met the most important person in my life, my dear wife, Philomena. I came here for an education, but I left with so much more than that. This is actually the third time I've had the honor of making a speech at Legon. The first one in September 20, 2000 when I delivered the University of Ghana alumni lecture at the Great Hall with the Vice Chancellor Ivan 
uh, spearheading it. I spoke on Ghana's history of economic development and reform, and I noted that we as Ghanaians possess a special value of tolerance and respect that has allowed us to avoid the conflicts and strife that have affected other African countries. But I also cautioned that our tolerance should not extend to political systems, policies, or institutions that need to serve our people better. The second time I spoke at Legon was 15 years later, in 2015, also at the Great Hall, where I had the honor to serve as a keynote speaker at the inaugural E.N. Umabu Memorial Lecture. On that occasion, I spoke on how to strengthen our democracy for a stronger economy and a stronger future. I called it positive politics for Ghana. On both occasions, I spoke on the urgency of addressing the problems that were holding us back as a nation. And on both occasions, I said the same thing. The black star cannot win. In between those two great hall lectures, I spoke at the opening session of the Economic Forum at Senchi, which was shared by the man we are honoring here today and convened by President, former President Mahama. One of my most vivid memories of Parkwisi was when we worked together at Senchi almost 10 years ago for such a crucial event. At that time, Ghana was facing several economic or several serious economic challenges. Fiscal deficits were high, rising public debt, energy subsidies, and a high public sector wage bill were threatening macroeconomic stability. Inflation and interest rate had jumped to into double figures. Together with Parkwesi and other political and development elites in Sinchi, we spent three days on substantive discussions about what the future of our country should be. We came out of St. G with a consensus, but only among a privileged few, without enough buy-in from all political parties. So the conversations and agreements we made ended up as a footnote in history rather than as a long-term strategy. The situation we face today may be even worse. Between 2000 and 2020, Ghana has experienced 13 years of rapid growth, including years of very rapid growth. But growth alone is not enough to sustain long-term development. Countries must transform their economies. Despite the strong growth rate, Ghana's economy has suffered from falling productivity in the manufacturing sector and high vulnerability to global markets and commodity price shocks. Its development has been marred by debt and energy crisis, large trade and fiscal imbalances, and a lack of long-term consistent planning. As a result, Ghana is not transforming. At the African Center for Economic Transformation, we developed the African Transformation Index to track countries' progress in this regard. An updated index will be released in a few weeks. And it will show that Ghana's economic transformation is in decline below the Africa average in all the areas used to measure success, such as diversification of products and exports, technology, and labor productivity. As we know, Ghana has just made another agreement with the IMF, but the stakes are higher. Political polarization is worse. Civic disengagement is higher. Ghana must not only solve its economic problems to enable transformation, 
it must safeguard these democratic traditions and institutions. Another election is on the horizon, and the next government will lead Ghana into the second quarter of the 21st century. These next 25 years are absolutely crucial or critical to Ghana's ability to secure its future. Another consensus is needed, but this time it needs to be a true national consensus, broader, with more stakeholder input and buying, especially among the youth, women, and civil society. In past lectures, I spoke on these issues in hypotheticals. Today, I do not have to do that. Today, I'm able to speak in more certain terms, specifically about a new initiative that I and many other concerned citizens are spearheading. It is called the Compact for Ghana's Political and the Economic Transformation. And through it, we are working right now to build the true national consensus that is so urgently needed. The Ghana Compact aims to frame the future we want for Ghana by 2050. It is a platform for setting a shared vision for a nation that will tackle our greatest challenges. It is intended to put Ghana on a more secure path forward by bringing better balance to our democratic process and more voices into our policy decisions or discussions. Our core belief with the Compact is this, for Ghana to truly deliver on its ambitions and achieve its greatest potential, we need to build a social contract between our citizens and our government, no matter who is in charge, to set a long-term vision for economic transformation that delivers dividends for its people. We all know the issues all too well. Every time government changes, our policies and programs change. Our constitution, though it has said as well, was written too long ago to work for all of today's challenges. Women still face barriers to equal rights and equal participation. Our businesses are not as competitive as they should be. Our youth need the skills, training, and opportunity to succeed. And of course, our fiscal health is weak. So, what would the Ghana Compact do that is different than all that has come before? A lot. It is more than an idea. It is more than a framework. It is a call to action. The Compact is bringing ordinary citizens into the discourse and discussion so that the initiative is informed first and foremost by the people of Ghana, from the ground up, not the top down. It is engaging youth on the issues that will define their lives. It is building a consensus among a wide, wide and varied group of stakeholders, from industry associations and trade unions to civil society the leadership of parliament and the council of state. In this way, the compact is not just another diagnosis. When finished, it will propose concrete solutions to address the historic constraints and challenges to our fiscal health, to safeguard our democracy and increase political, and increasing political polarization, distrust, and disengagement and to put Ghana on a successful path to economic transformation and sustainable, inclusive growth. At the African Center for Economic Transformation, we have worked closely with a network of most of the major policy think tanks and policy institutes to supply this initiative with empirical foundations. And I'm glad to see that ISA at the University of Ghana has been a great partner in this analysis. I thank them very much for that.
More than half a dozen research papers have been produced so far, and we have more citizens' dialogues and engagements planned, as well as national, as well as a national mobilisation campaign. I'm certain that we will get into even more aspects of the compact in the discussions that follow. Now, in light of all this, I want to take a moment and reiterate the theme of today's conference. Economic policy making in Ghana, lessons learned, and the way forward. The Ghana Compact is, in my view, a true workable blueprint for applying past lessons towards a better future. But of course, it all comes down to crafting and implementing smart, informed economic policies that enable transformation. So before I conclude, allow me to make one very important point right now. We know what it takes to transform. Other countries have done it, most notably in Asia, where Korea, Malaysia, and others offer examples to follow. But we also have some good examples on our own continent of countries that have started on a transformation journey, such as Mauritius and South Africa. Asset has studied this extensively, and we have a good idea of what works and what doesn't work. In Africa, we know that all countries, no matter their unique circumstances, must diversify production and exports, improve competitiveness in global markets, boost productivity, especially labor productivity, upgrade technology across industries, and improve human well-being through higher wages and better jobs. These are the fundamental components of successful transmission strategies and they, may, they must be central to economic policy making in African countries. Ladies and gentlemen, I do not have to tell you that there are no shortcuts cuts to the solutions we seek. But we do not need shortcuts. We need commitment. We need action. For too long, Ghana has suffered from a surplus of politics and a deficit of ideas. It is time to change that. The stakes are too high. The Ghana Compact does not provide all the answer, answers, but it does provide a way forward. When I spoke at Senchi, I said that we are not just any nation. I believe this still today. I always will. We are a nation of unparalleled history and culture. We respect for one another and an unwavering belief in democracy. We have natural human resources, natural human resources that can prepare us into the future. We have an engaged and innovative youth population ready to tackle the challenges of the 21st century. We cannot squander this gift we have. As I said earlier, the black star cannot win. As, I, as some of you may know, I recently wrote a book, Know the Beginning Well, which traces five decades of African development. The title is based on my favorite African proverb. If you know the beginning well, the end shall not trouble you. If you know the beginning well, the end shall not trouble you. It is in that spirit that I have approached the Ghana Compact. The next election will help set us on the course for the next quarter century. But we must learn from the past to ensure a better future for our children and for our grandchildren. I'm often asked, what still, what still motivates me or why I keep pushing? They are the answer. 
Paukis' children, his son Kwisi, and his daughter Araba, are with us, and they help organize this event. And so is Matilda's granddaughter Emily. Two of my own granddaughters, Nana and Mami, and three of my grandchildren, Kofi, Mina, and Kari, are also here today. So as I look around this room, I can see the future. Right in front of me. I'm humbled and honored to speak in front of you. My granddaughter Mina lives in Accra. She's a child growing up in Ghana, just as I was. When I envision a, bit, a better future, I do it through her eyes. What kind of opportunities will be available to her? Will her well-being be better than it is today? Looking ahead to 2050, Mina will be 40 years old. <laughs> if Ghana's leaders put our people first and come to, together to adopt a unified transformation strategy and stick with it between now and then, Mina will see a hopeful vision turned into reality. She will see an economy that is diversified, stable, and providing its citizens with higher and steadily rising levels of income. An economy that is generating more productive jobs and a workforce that is better equipped to excel with equal opportunities for women and men alike. An economy that is no longer based on traditional agriculture, raw materials and extraction, low value services, but on, on innovation, modern industries, and higher value services. An economy supported by higher and more efficient levels of national investment prepared by sound fiscal strategies. If Mina saw all these things, she would see an economy that's becoming more sustainable and the society becoming more inclusive. She would see a country better equipped to deploy policies that will reach the poor and the vulnerable. She will see a country with increased life funds, reduced income gaps, and less poverty. So, in that context, allow me to close by reading from the last paragraph of my book. I do not know if Mina will see the Ghana I have envisioned my, my whole life. But I hope she does. And I believe she will. My journey is nearing its conclusion. Her journey and a better one for Ghana and Africa is just beginning. I know Parquisi shared the same hope and vision for Ghana. I look forward to discussing these issues further with you. Thank you very much. That was Dr. Kewa Maku. He spoke for about 20 minutes, and you could tell the emotion. He was talking about the importance of continuity and consistency in policy making. And he answered the question, why does he bother? I mean, this is a man who entered the University of Ghana, as he said, in 1968. So he's, he's not a young man, and he's still concerned about Ghana's economy. I sat down with him after his uh, brief speech to try and get clarity on some of the issues he raised. And I initially wanted to find out if after that emotive end to a brilliant presentation, I actually wanted to even talk about it. So we sat down for about half an hour. Here are some highlights of that. And watch out for the question Professor Ernest Aite, himself an economist, asked at the end of the presentation, which question Dr. Kewa Maku took some time to answer. This program has been planned such that the, 
the, the speech will be the main thing. And in fact, we, we struggled to bring this Q&A session. And you got me a bit teary-eyed at the end. So I really want to find out whether you want to go ahead to do the interview. Because the, the speech was so elegant. And I think you ticked all the boxes. And sometimes questions can dilute the speech. So I want to ask before these people gathered, <laughs> do you still want to go ahead? <laughs> or should we leave it at what you just did? <laughs> Raise the sound. Do you hear me? Yeah. Yes, we can hear you. Ben, you've been trying to interview me for a long time. This is your opportunity. <laughs> so you planned this together. So let's go ahead. <laughs> yeah, because initially it was five minutes. It became 10 minutes. It's 15 minutes. But we are so grateful. And you took the wind out of my sail because my first question for you would have been, why do you even bother to talk about these things after having done development work since 1974? Right, and but I think the Mina story you brought it, it, it sort of answers it. And rarely do I start an interview having my first question being taken away from me. <laughs> Was that deliberately in the plan? You wanted to? No, no. It's it's the passion, mm. and you know I've been fortunate. I grew up in Ghana. I went to secondary school, government second technical school, and and Takrade. Then I came to Legon, uh, had a good career at Legon, like I said, and then I went to Berkeley. And when I was growing up, I was 13 years old at Independence. Wow. So the spirit of a one Ghana, a one Africa, that Nkrumah articulated, that was what was in me. And that's why I grew up in me. And I went to Berkeley, then I went to the World Bank, and everything I did at the World Bank, all the bears. It was always at the back, Africa. I worked with leaders. When I went to the Economic Commission for Africa, I worked with leaders. I brought them together, the UN. So the passion for what Africa could be, that was embedded in me when I was growing up. Never left. So that is what drives me. And as I say, when you talk about the future, it's about the children, our grandchildren. So those combination of my past and also my view of what the future should be, that's what drives me. How important is history in understanding current economic phenomena? Oh, very much so. And I said in my book, uh, that's what I spent 500 pages trying to understand what has worked. So in terms of history for African economic development, to where we are today, forget the early, day, the, early day, the, the first decade of independence, but in the 80s and 90s, and you look from what happened then, the crisis we had with HIPAA, going back to HIPAA, bringing in poverty reduction strategies, structural adjustment, you name it, all those factors. And then when I was at the EC and I started talking uh, you know, there was a time, you remember, there was this story that Africa was growing and the six of the ten fastest countries in growing were, were African. The economists at some stage had an article, Africa, the hopeless continent. And then they said, oh, Africa, the hope, something like that. It changed. But then I realized the more things change, the more they stay the same. Mm. We've been through all this, but, structure, all this, but our economies and when commodities prices go up, then things are happy. We talk about integration, our economies, and, the, and all these ideas. So in a sense, that is why I think history matters, to learn what has worked, what hasn't worked. But my sense is that we can make it, but we have to learn from the past. When I look at your life, every decade something new happens. Mm. 1974, mm. World Bank. Ten years later, Zambia. <laughs> Ten years later, UN. Twelve years later, Asset. A few years later, Senchi. <laughs> so what is defining for you about this time and this decade? What is the most defining thing? Things around the world is changing. You can't take things for granted. Look at Ukraine. Look at COVID. All these factors affecting us. 
Look at the global financial architecture, the world system that we're putting in place. It's not working for Africa. So it's a bold, difficult, and challenging times in most ways. And one of the things we're doing now, as I said, with other think tanks around the country, is to bring an African voice for the global financial architecture reforms on debt management, or more aid, or let, uh, more concessional financing on the role of the private sector, and to get African voice to deal with today's circumstances. But first of all, today I've been talking about the consensus within Ghana. We need a consensus at the African level. My biggest frustration, and let me come to it, when I hear people say Africa and China, Africa and Russia. Russia. What's Africa? Africa is a collection of 54 countries, individual countries. So when you have 54 countries dealing with China, <laughs> it's not the same. So African unity, African coming together, crafting a common vision. And the AFCFTA, I think, offers us. It's been a long time in coming. When I was at the EC, I pushed so hard, then started the African Center, African uh, Trade Policy Center to do all the analysis studies that eventually became the underpinnings for the AFCFTA. So my, question, my answer is that the times are difficult now, but we need, and leadership matters a lot. Mm. And when I look at the AU, where uh, I'm, you, you get me going to some. You get that even than the leadership cohesion today, and I compare it to African leadership around the time when I was at the EC, when NEPAD was being put together, when the APR. There was a lot of uh, com coming together. I don't see that. Now. So consensus is important mm. to deal with today's challenges and to craft an African agenda for and that's some of the things we are doing at the EC. You, you've been very strong on transformation. Today you said for the past 20 years, we've had at least 13 years of strong growth, yet growth alone is not enough. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Transformation is key. I've also heard you say that transformation can only take place when informed policies are championed by visionary leadership mm. implemented by capable institutions. Yeah. So it's informed policies visionary leaders, capable institutions, which of the three would you say is most pressing <laughs> for us as a country and for the continent? Well, I think they all come together. I mean, I've been asked this question a lot of times, and, you know, even before this uh, session, I was looking at an article I wrote for the Course magazine, which was that. And there are seven lessons, if you want to unpack them, what you just said. Is the totality of it that matters. But I come to the leadership issue because you specify asked for that. You know, we transformation is a long term. That's why it takes twenty, thirty years mm. to get there. It's not two years or three years. So you need to have a long term vision. You need to have a plan, right? That's what Koreas and the others did. You can't go back and forth. And in creating that vision, you need to bring people together to craft a vision that matters. And then each government to follow through. You need consistency in policies and programs. You can't go for two or three years. And that's one of the things we're talking about in Ghana. A government comes and things change. Mm. And the programs and the policies change. You don't have consistency. So you need that consistency. You need to work together. Transformation is a partnership, particularly between the private sector and the state. Mm. Right. And that partnership matters. The private sector has to produce the goods, do the export, do all these things. The state has certain core functions that it must have, like macroeconomic stability, all those. So it, but it's that partnership together that that matters. So those are some of the, and we need to work together in a sense. And there comes the leadership issue. It's about also leadership. You know, the leadership matters everywhere, in every country in the world. But for poorer countries, 
leadership matters more. And we talk about political leadership that are critical, but it's about leadership at all levels, not just political leaders. And people ask me, especially when it comes to political leadership, what are the characteristics of political that you want to see? Mm. There's been a lot of research, but there's a book written by uh, an American, uh, forget the name, that goes in depth in this. I say, and if you look at what's happened in Korea and all these other countries, the, the, the characters of good leadership as a political leadership, one, a leader who has a vision <laughs> of where they want to take the country, who governs selflessly, who can inspire others to greater heights, a leader who also believes in smart policies as an economist. So those are the characteristics and if you go through history and you look at countries that have done well, the circumstances are today different than when Korea, Lee Kuan Yew, and all those people were pushing the agenda. But those are some of the characteristics. How do we bring a polarized country together? You made reference to 2015 Senchi, and that even though it was a good program, because it wasn't far reaching enough, it just became a brief pause in history. And the, div the division in the country arguably is worse now than it was in 2015. We have an election in a year and a half. How do we keep our politics going without it continuing to divide us and preventing the consistency that you are talking about? Several things. I mean, this kind of discussion is important. <laughs> That's what the compass is trying to do. That like we've been involved in all the people we brought together. I was very pleased to see the Twitter space conversations you guys were having. You were involved with the youth, talking about even we had a Twitter space on values. In fact, that's one of the things we need to pick values, our values as a people. Because people get the government they deserve, right? So it's our values also factor in. So it's consensus among the widespread people. It's looking at our values as a people and what we need to do differently. So those are some, 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 some of, the, of the issues that uh, the compact is trying to deal with. I have two more issues to raise before I would probably selfishly select one or two people I like to ask questions. Maybe Professor Diamond Sai and Co. A lot of times when you and those who want Ghana to do well complain about Ghana. My friends in, in the Western world think that yeah. Ghana is doing so well. Mm. You know, they said, ah, look at the West African sub-region. You guys are the only quote-unquote correct country. So why are your people so worried? <laughs> right. So I don't know whether it is a wrong perspective or how should we situate Ghana's seeming success when we compare ourselves to our peers within the sub-region? Ben, that's a good question. I face that all the time. In fact, I was recently in Washington talking to a lot of people in terms of the compact, trying to get support for the compact in many ways. I met with the National Endowment for Democracy. I met with some people in the State Department. You know, I have friends, as you can imagine. Talk to them. And when you say Ghana, I say this Ghana story. Sometimes they look at me in disbelief that, oh, in Africa, Ghana is a beacon for democracy. Obama came here and said, so remember, uh, Kamala Harris was recently here. It's true. If you compare it to what's happening in other parts of Africa, and they point to me, uh, up, uh, Burkina Faso, Mali, Sudan, Ethiopia, all those things. But the full point I say is that democracy is important and Ghanaians believe in democracy. But if you look at Afrobarometer, its recent report shows that the Ghanaians believe in democracy is high, but they are still losing faith a bit. So it's not the same, at least among us. So that's, that, that's my answer to your question. But more importantly, if we are a beacon, I think we can even do better to become even more a shining 
mm. example to others. Is democracy a price we must pay for lower transformation? I ask this because some of the examples given, including Rwanda, including mm. China, mm. including Korea at the time, even Singapore to an extent, there was a certain level of continuity in government. They didn't have the sort of animated elections we have every four years. So that the consistency we are not having is a price we pay for having to change governments every four years. Is it a trade-off? What are your thoughts? Well, I addressed that question in the last chapter of my book. Because what I did was I took our political systems, I took our leaders I've worked with, and at some stage, I compared Ghana and Rwanda. And I made the remark that we both have different histories. Rwanda as a country, genocide, strong man coming, brought the country together, right? Discipline, based upon the past, okay? And that's what has led Rwanda move forward and make so much progress. In Ghana, because of our multi-party democracy and what I've just said, the back and forth, the back and forth, we don't have the same consistency of policies and programs. And a lot of people say, therefore, we need a strong man in Ghana. I say, hey, hold on. We have our own history mm. as a nation. We started with Nkrumah's time. We went to the one-party dictatorship, more or less later. We had military back, uh, cool guitars back and forth. And then we brought in democracy that has sustained us for the last 30 years. We should be proud of that. We should be able to make corrective changes. But it doesn't mean we should throw it aside and bring in a, another. So every country's history. But what I said in the book was that if we can get our act together, as Ghana, for all the reasons, we become even a greater model. And that's what most African countries should go for. Wonderful. But the question was, how do we get our act together? That's what one of the reviewers of my book said. And that's what the compact is all Wonderful. about. Wonderful. So the compact is the bonus question. And that question is basically to say that you said some of the attempts to build consensus in the past have not been inclusive enough. So it's been very elite focused. So now you are bringing the youth, you are bringing women, you are bringing, in fact, you are going no. to have citizen engagement. Yeah. I, I, let, let me be clear on that. Okay. I think the consensus at the time mm. in century was important. Okay. It brought us together, the key people, it moved us forward. It allowed the government to come up with the IMF program and stabilize the economy. Mm. It was good. So then, that's the point I'm trying to make. And President Mahama is here, uh, how he play the key role at a critical time? But the point I'm saying that where we are now, mm. we need a consensus that goes beyond that of uh, 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 bringing everybody around this over time, build it over a year or so. And that's what we are trying to do. And the final point is that, look, what is democracy? Democracy is about citizens holding governments to account. Mm. Citizens holding governments to account. So what we're trying to do with this type of citizens' engagements, making sure that ordinary citizens, for example, we have something called citizens' assemblies. We're going to go to about 20 districts in Ghana put issues on the table like free SSH. What do the people think? Health, what are the issues? What's working, what's not working? An issue like climate change. It's affecting Northern Ghana in particular. How do they see, what are the points? Climate smart agriculture, how do we implement it? So getting citizens, voices mm. into the debate into the dialogue and using that to help future governments. That's what I call it's about a social contract. Wonderful. And I think we have up to a thousand citizens here. Please put your hands together for Dr. Kewaya Mwako. And this is the Park Museum Mr. Arthur Memorial. We're having a quick chat with 
our keynote speaker. So it's not really a keynote speech, it's a keynote interview. <laughs> First time I've seen so in my life. Um, I just want to acknowledge a few people to let them know we know they are here. And we are not going to take questions, but for such a high level conversation, if there are a couple of quick comments, I'll take it. I want to acknowledge former VC, Professor Inestaite, who just joined us, put your together for him. <laughs> I want to acknowledge former Deputy Minister Monakote, who also joined us. Thank you very much, Madam. Fifi Kwete, who is also the General Secretary of the NDC, is here with us. Let's acknowledge him, please. <laughs> Guzitano is also here with us. Please put your hands together for him. And acknowledge Moses Asaga as well, a former minister of many things. Put your hands together for him. <laughs> <laughs> and former MP for Nabdam. So, look, I, I don't want to spoil this with too many questions. But uh, since Ben Dochemalo said that Professor Diamond has written a book we have not finished reading, there's a very big book indeed. It's one of the, <laughs> the more broad-based academics I know. Prof, any quick thoughts on what your friend has said? You were chair when you invited him, 2000, to give the University of Ghana lecture, 23 years ago. And he's back here. You are also still here. Anything you need to ask him or you are okay with what he said so far? So, Ben, if you can go to Professor Diamond, just a few quick thoughts from him. If not, I'll ask Professor Akila Pasoya. This one is reserved for just the former VCs. We are, this, the, this former VC corner. Hello. <laughs> well, I think I'm okay. Uh, you know, let the younger people. <laughs> okay, Professor Akila Pasoya. I don't think you heard Adam Mesa properly. Yeah, right. You said let the young people. Oh, the younger people. Okay. <laughs> okay, so that's Professor Aite then. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, KY. Um, I've enjoyed listening to your responses to Bernard. Uh, I've been quite active in the engagement with the compact. One of the questions that we haven't uh, been able to address fully has been how to get that consensus in place to reflect the views of as many Ghanaian as possible. You know, um, some, I was happy to hear you talk about the engagement with the district assemblies. How do we move beyond that to ensure that the views expressed at these assemblies are carried through and have some influence? I like the definition you gave about democracy, that citizens hold sure. their governments to account. Yeah. Yeah. And it's a very, very plausible one. It's one that we should all embrace. What are the mechanisms doing that. We have a constitution that makes it extremely difficult. Um, I know you've been quite active in trying to get uh, changes made to the constitution. Uh, there are many or some Ghanaians who are adamant. How do we prepare ourselves for a future in which the political culture is not only determined by the constitution mm. but by people sure. being able to hold their government to account. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Can I? Uh, thanks, uh, Ernest. And Ernest has been a good uh, companion and champion on the compact, so we've talked a lot. It's been a part of all the discussions, but you put your finger on it. The, the, it's been a process. So where we are now is to, we've done all this and we've set a clear vision. Now we want to go to the next stage, which is to mobilize the average citizen. So these citizen assemblies we're going to be doing is one. But we're going to have a campaign. And uh, we have a campaign that we put together. We're discussing it. I've had some help with some of mine. <laughs> I will not want to embarrass somebody here who helped me put it together. Uh, but one of my daughters is a specialist in this area. So we have something we call hashtag Ghana2050. And we're going to use all sorts of media, technology, engagements, so that between now and the time when the campaigns are in full swing, the voices of the people in terms of what matters to them, what they want in health, what the challenge they see, can influence the debates. And we also had what I call one interparty dialogue at the dinner where we brought some of the leaders political parties, uh, Fifi Koto was there, the, some of the NPP leaders were there. 
we talk candidly about how can we make sure that the next election are more issues oriented, that the issues that will be addressed, that the issues that the manifestos of the political parties will embrace will derive from what the citizens are seeing and through the compact process. So we want to marry. Ultimately, we have to elect a government through a democratic process. But we're saying that citizens' voices and their needs should drive. And the other issue we know is the monetization of our politics. It's a huge factor. How do you get citizens' engagements and voices to also bring to bear? So that's what I wanted to say. So we are, that's the state we are in. And then it comes down to this idea of a social contract. And we're going to have something we call a citizens convention, where we're going to bring citizens, political, or everybody together, where we pull all this thing together for a discussion. Maybe by the end of this year or early January. And we hope that we will help the political process and the discourse and the goal setting for this country with a vision for what we want to see in 2050. And the other point, and, I'm, and that's the last part, uh, uh, permit me to say this. You mentioned the Constitution. The Constitution has served us well for 30 years. But it's also clear that there are certain things that need to change if you want to have the Ghana, we want to transform Ghana we're talking about. And my frustration is that every day you hear people making speeches about the Constitution. We had a, a Professor Atukuba is here. We have the Constitution Review Committee made a report. A lot is there. Yeah. We need to move to action and to tackle some of the key. Yeah. For example, in terms of the role of the National Plan Demand Commission, I didn't say so, but when we're talking about the lessons, mm. It's that I said it's a partnership, consistency, but you need an agent mm. somewhere that makes sure this continuity. So institution, the institution, NDPC. But when you see how the NDPC over the years has functioned and the constraint it faces, it's not been effective. And it's in the constitution. Well, let's go back and say, how do we make the MP NDC? And, 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 and what? NDPC. There's a strong force here. So NDPC. <laughs> <laughs> it's just, it's just pushing. <laughs> NDPC. <laughs> the P. <laughs> Efforts on the P. <laughs> Not the D or the C. The P. <laughs> the, the NDPC be the agent that we set a long term vision. They have five year development plans. Every government comes, comes to the house, it's five years development, but it ties to the long term vision. And the NDP has become the referee. So institutions matter. So, well, you see the anyway. difference that between a journalist question and a VC's question? <laughs> you spend almost 10 minutes answering the question. <laughs> that, that's the cue for me to end. So, we want to say thank you. Let's put our hands together for Dr. Kewaya Mako. <laughs> for and I need to say this, for any unanswered questions, get his book. You know, it is a very important book. I hope the Legon Bookshop has it. Yeah. Know the beginning well. That is the title of the book. Yeah. And it is a must read for anybody who, Professor Babwati, nobody should graduate from development economics not having read yeah. that book. And I'm saying this as a former student of the department. <laughs> and I hope you ratify it. The Columbia University and other places as a... As a Wonderful. As so a let's put that together for Professor Dr. Kewa Yamuako. Thank you. Welcome, Ben. So that was uh, Dr. Kewa Yamuako in conversation with me in front of a packed audience at the CD Conference Center, University of Ghana. It was part of the KB Emisa Arthur Forum to celebrate his legacy as economist and former vice president, Dr. Kera Marku spoke about how to build consensus. He spent some time discussing the compact that he's championing, which he believes is the way to build long-term consensus on Ghana's economy. We hope you've learned something useful in this engagement. Thank you for watching our special edition of The Point of View, which I brought to you from the CD Conference Center of the University of Ghana Economics Department. 
We'll be with you next time. Bye-bye.